thank you for the great introduction. Um, and let's start with our today's short session. Uh, it will be about the artificial left types, a quick introduction, and the selection criteria on which we will have the main focus today. Uh, and the last part of the session will be uh, questions and answers. Our agenda for today will be introduction to artificial left and when artificial left is needed, types of artificial left, including gas left and pump left. Pump left will include the soccer root pump, the jet pump, ESP, and PCP. The, those are the main focus artificial left types today. And then the artificial left selection criteria will be the main topic for today. So at the early stage of a well life where the well has is not connected to other oil producers that had depleted your reservoir, you will find your well at the initial pressure. In this case, if the well has a good quality, it will be most probably at the initial period of its life will be capable to produce natural. What does this mean? This means that the reservoir is capable in terms of the pressure and quality is capable of delivering the reservoir fluids to the bottom of the well at a pressure that is sufficient to lift the fluids up to the surface and overcome, overcome what? Overcome the pressure due to the weight of the fluid column, which we call the hydrostatic pressure, overcome the friction inside the tubing and casing, and also deliver the fluids to the surface at the required wellhead flowing the pressure, WHFP, wellhead flowing the pressure, is the pressure required to be delivered at the surface to deliver the fluid to the production facility, which will overcome the friction inside the flu line and any pressure change due to the elevation change and deliver the produced fluid to the facility at the required landing pressure. So at the beginning of the life of an initial pressure, well, it will be capable to deliver, especially for gas and light oil, wells will be capable to deliver the oil to the surface with a pressure at the surface in the closed status. That is called the shotting tubing head pressure which is here, for example, 180 bar. With the assembly of the chokes and valves that is existing at the wheel head and the flow line, which we call the Christmas tree and the flow line valves, the well is kept shutting. Once we open the well, the pressure will drop at the surface, and at the bottom hole also, so that the well will flow to the production facility. So once you open your well, flow will start to be delivered from the reservoir boundary down to the bottom hole of the well, then up to the casing and the tubing to the surface and be delivered to the production facility and the pressure at the well head in this case will be called the flow the flowing tubing head pressure tubing head flowing the pressure or 
flow line pressure if the choke is fully open will be the same or more or less the same. So once we open a naturally flowing well, the pressure will drop, creating what we call the drawdown. The drawdown is the pressure differential between the reservoir pressure and the bottom hole flowing pressure. So at a zero rate or a static condition, the pressure at the bottom of the well will be the same as the reservoir pressure and the rate will be zero. There is a relationship that relates the drawdown of the bottom hole pressure with the rate inside the reservoir. As we can expect that as the bottom hole pressure decreases, the pressure delivered from the reservoir the, will be much higher than the bottom hole pressure and the delta P will increase, delivering more fluids in terms of the rate to the bottom of the well. So the relationship between the bottom hole pressure and the rate inside the reservoir will be inversely proportional relationship, which is this line called the IPR or the inflow performance relationship. So the inflow performance relationship is a relationship that describes the relation between the bottom hole flowing the pressure and the rate inside the reservoir. And it is an inversely proportional relationship. On the other hand, if we split the system into two parts, the reservoir performance will be described in terms of the IPR and the outflow performance or the vertical lift performance will be described as a VLP or the vertical lift performance relationship. This is a directly proportional relationship as we can see to deliver more rate up the well, you will need to have more pressure at the bottom in order to overcome the frictions, the weight or the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid column and the flow wing well head pressure. That means that the VLP will be represented by this directly proportional relationship and the IPR will be represented by the IPR relationship and the intersection of both will be the operating point. So as long as the IPR and VLP are inter intersecting, the well is capable to produce naturally. That means at this rate and bottom hole pressure, the fluids will be delivered by the natural potential of the reservoir down to the bottom hole of the well and up to the flowing facility, to the production facility. The term drawdown is describing the differential pressure across the reservoir, the P reservoir minus PWF or the P reservoir minus the bottom hole flowing pressure here, for example, if the static reservoir pressure is 5,000 PSI and the flowing bottom hole pressure naturally is 2,800, means that we are creating 2,200 PSI drawdown. The relationship between the rate inside the reservoir and the drawdown is a directly, an, a, a directly relationship, a, direct, a directly proportional relationship. That means, well, the drawdown increase, the rate will increase. And the constant of this relationship will be called the J or the productivity index, sometimes called productivity index, PI or J. We'll not dig in deep in this one, but what happens if we drill a well that is penetrates a depleted reservoir? In that the pressure had declined from this well and the 
other producers from the same tank, as you produce from the same tank, the pressure will start to decline. Meaning that at one point, the pressure will not be any longer capable to deliver the fluids to the surface. It is described here by this empty volume of the well. So, now this well is not capable of producing naturally and the fluids are not reaching to the surface. We need some sort of artificial lifting. That's why it's called the artificial lift because the well itself cannot deliver the fluid to the surface by its natural potential. So we need some sort of pumping or some sort of intervention that creates this flow. This will be either a pump or injecting gas in this hydrostatic fluid column that reduces the back pressure of the fluid column or the hydrostatic or reduces the gradient of the column by reducing the density. As the gas content of the fluid increases, its density will decrease and the well natural pressure will be capable of lifting this up. So there is two types of artificial left May, two main categories, the gas lift and the pump lift. There is one sort, this is one sort of the pump lift, which is the ESP pump. Here, the ESP, which is the electrical submersible pump, is immersed in the well fluid, producing the fluid to the surface by the centrifugal multi-stage pump called the ESP. And now the well can be produced at lower bottom hole pressure. Now the intersection is no longer achieved, but there is some sort of added pressure to the fluids in order to lift them up. Same analog to the water pump at your house. If the, you are living in a high floor and the water doesn't reach to your floor due to the weight of the water inside the tubes, you will need a water pump to lift your water and be delivered to your floor. So that is the main difference between a naturally flowing well that is capable to, by the natural flow potential to deliver the fluids to the surface and an artificially produced well, which is using some sort of intervention that flows the fluids artificially to the surface. Here, the intersection between the VLP and the IPR are no longer there. There is some question, I will check the chat for now. Why the VLP curve in the initial period is inversely uh, proportional? Yes, this is because the there is two, the VLP can be divided into two regions, a region of hydrostatic dominant and the other region of the friction dominant. The friction dominant will be mainly, the friction loss will increase highly by the increase in the, by the increase in the flow rate, which is the normal part of the curve. This, Deflection is not always existing in there, it depends on the characteristics of the flowing medium and the flowing fluid. Okay, so both doesn't intersect means that 
the well is not capable of producing naturally. We need some sort of artificial left to deliver them up. Running this pump on and opening your well will deliver. The pump will be designed by the number of stages that deliver your fluids with the required pressure at the surface. Here, another two terms will be added, which is a pump intake pressure, which is a bottom hole following the pressure at the pump depth, and the pump discharge pressure, which is the pump intake pressure plus the added pressure by the pump. This pump discharge pressure should be designed to deliver the required pressure to lift the well at the design rate, to lift the fluids up the well at the design rate. Here we can note that the pressure here in the static conditions is zero because the fluid doesn't reach to the surface by the natural pressure. But once you turn the pump on, the fluids will reach to the surface and starting to be produced to the production facility. From the IPR, it is clear that at zero rate, there is zero drawdown, meaning that the static conditions, the static bottom hole pressure, which will be the same as the reservoir pressure, zero drawdown and zero rate, meaning that the bottom hole pressure is the same as the reservoir pressure, the pressure differential is zero and the rate is zero, represented by this point. On the other hand, this point, is represented by the Q max or the absolute open flow, which is a theoretical point. It is the flow rate at if we manage to produce at a zero bottom hole flowing the pressure. The simplest representation of the IPR is the straight line IPR. Okay, this is the relationship between the pressure decline and the IPR. So if the IPR is represented by this curve, the future IPR will be a parallel curve to the previous IPR with the intersection with the y-axis as the new reservoir pressure. So as the pressure declines, the IPR will be shifted down, leading at last that the BLP will not intersect the IPR and the well will be no longer producing naturally. That's why we will need the artificial left. What are the causes other than the pressure decline that can lead to the well not capable to produce naturally? First one is a reservoir pressure decline, and this can be cured by the water injection support drilling another well that injects water in the same reservoir leading to an increase in the reservoir pressure and the well back to production naturally. Or gas injection in the gas cap, I'm not. So water injection and gas injection. Okay, so as clear from here, the initial condition is the green one. After depletion, the IPR will be shifted down and no intersection we can bring the pressure back by injecting some fluids into the reservoir to maintain the pressure up. Another reason for the no flow or the no natural flow condition is the reservoir quality itself, the initial reservoir quality, or some sort of damage that is happening to the reservoir. So some wells are high pressure, low quality, meaning that the deliverability or the productivity of the reservoir is not that high that can deliver the required flow rates to the surface. This can be cured by stimulation. So some sort of stimulation can be done to restore the red line to the green one. Stimulation may include the acidization, fracking, and chemical intervention or we can do a simple reperforation job to increase the productivity of the well. 
So a productivity drop may lead to a well that was initially flowing naturally, will not flow naturally at the same reservoir pressure. Moving on the back pressure, because as we see in here, the pressure in the reservoir or the pressure delivered by the artificial lift system should overcome the pressure at this point. Because if we close the well partially, we will need more pressure to deliver the fluids at the surface. Or any back pressure from the facility will lead to more pressure required to lift the fluids up, meaning that the VLP will be shifted up, meaning at the same rate, we will require higher bottom hole pressure to deliver the fluids. So back pressure is some sort of operations that will lead the well to cease to flow or decline in production. In this case, we can reduce the flow line pressure, modify the density or the viscosity, or reduce the friction of the tubing or install artificial lift to overcome the back pressure. In this regard, some wells are capable to produce naturally with very high rates, but due to the very high back pressure from the facility, we have to install artificial lift from day one. And from where this back pressure comes, it comes from the other wells or from the facility pressure, the separator pressure and so on. It's simply the pressure required to overcome the friction inside the flow line, the first surface flow lines, and to deliver the fluids to the facility with the required landing pressure. So as the landing pressure increases, the well head flowing pressure increases, and as the friction increases, the well head pressure increases. Okay, let's move on. Understanding that the VLP representing at each rate the required pressure to lift the fluids up at this specific rate, and the IPR is the bottom hole pressure required to be at the bottom of the well in order for the reservoir to deliver the specific rate and the intersection is the operating point. What if we have this well naturally flowing and we need to increase the flow rate from this well? We would need to detect how much pressure we need to add to the available pressure from the natural potential of the reservoir and the required pressure. The difference between both at each rate is the required pressure from the artificial lift system. So starting with our artificial lift systems, we said that we have the gas lift system and the pump lift system. The first and most common pump lift system is the saccharoid pump, which we see in all fields and movies for the oil production industry. Here, this is the saccharoid pump system. Give me... Yeah, this is the, it consists of the downhole pump and the surface pump. The surface pump will be mainly used to change the rotation movement of the prime mover into a reciprocating movement of the rod and the blanca. So it is a simple positive displacement pump driven by a surface unit. And the surface unit is driving by a prime mover. Here we can see that the prime mover will transmit the rotational movement to the crank. The crank will move the bitmen, and this will lead to 
a vertical reciprocating movement of the horse head and hereby a movement of the bridle, the polished rod, and the sucker rod string. On the down stroke, moving down we will call the down stroke and moving up will be called the up stroke. A full stroke will include a downward, one downward and one upward movement. There is a stuffing box that prevents the leak inside this tubing from around the rod. Okay, so this stuffing box is a pressure control equipment during the normal operation of the up and down movement of the bullish rod. And the only function of the surface unit is to move the loads of the rods and the fluids up and down and convert the prime mover rotational movement to a reciprocating movement. On the down stroke, if we zoom in here, we will see two types of valves, the traveling valve and the standing valve. On the down stroke, the standing valve will be in a closed position. So the fluids inside the well, that doesn't reach to the surface, but the fluid inside the well will be moved above the plunger. The traveling valve is open in the down stroke and the standing valve is closed. So fluids will move above the plunger and around the rod. On the upper stroke, the plunger will start displacing the fluids up the tubing up to the surface. So in the upper stroke, the standing valve will open, allowing more fluid to enter the barrel, and the plunger and its traveling valve will close and move the fluids up, and so on. Down and upward strokes, a simple reciprocating positive displacement pump theory. Okay, the surface unit will be, should be able to carry out the loads of the fluids and the rod. So in highly deviated wells, this kind of system is not applicable. Why? Because the bullish, the rod will be having some friction and side loads with the tubing. And this will lead to some problems like erosion in the tubing or breaking of the rod strength. So this is not applicable in highly deviated and high dog leg severity. Well, and also there is some limitation in the surface unit that the surface unit will carry the weight of the rod. So there is limitations on the weight. So it handles only low rates. And also there is limitation on the depth because as the depth increase, the weight and length of the rod increase and the loads will increase. So simply the sucker rod pump is a robust and reliable pump on the shallow and low rates applications. As long as the loads here are okay, you are in good shape. And also, it is somewhat obstructive because this big surface unit cannot be installed in the offshore application. So it is limited mainly to the land application. Moving on to the gas lift system, the gas lift system will make use of the produced gas to take some gas one time. It will be taken as an amount for one time, but it will always occupy some capacity of the production facility. So the produced stream will be separated at the surface and gas will be processed and compressed 
to be pumped inside the analogs. The tubing is equipped with some gas lift valves, which can be retrieved and installed by regular operations. So the gas lift theory depends on a single injection point. So these two valves are only functioning in the unloading process. Once we unload the well, the only open valve will be the deepest valve or the working valve, wherever it is, a single injection point. So the gas in, in, is injected through the analyst by compressors and injected to the tubing. This leads to the mixing of this gas with the heavy fluid inside the tubing, make it, it lighter. So the lighter fluids will lead to lighter pressure or lower pressure required at the bottom wall, creating some drawdown between the reservoir pressure and bottom hole pressure. So the well will start flowing. So the theory of the gas lift is creating a lighter fluid coulomb inside the tubing, leading to a drawdown between the reservoir pressure and the bottom hole pressure, leading to the flow. But this application is not very reliable on one thing, which is it cannot create high drawdowns because the natural reservoir pressure at last will need to overcome the hydrostatic pressure, even if it is lower than the normal case, and overcome the wellhead pressure. There is no added pressure, it's just decreasing the back pressure from the denser fluid cool. So the theory of the gas lift by injecting this gas from the analyst into the tubing through gas lift valves and reducing the drawdown, but creating low drawdown and require a complicated surface facilities. So you will need a source of gas and a compressor for this gas. So the initial expenditure is very high. But the servicing of this type of artificial lift is very low in cost that the gas lift valves can be changed by light regular operations. This how the gas lift valves and are installed and retrieved from what we call the side bucket mandrel. The side bucket mandrel is a tubing accessory where the gas lift valve is installed. So the benefits of this gas lift valve, whenever the facility of the gas lift is there, the gas source is there, this is one of the most efficient artificial lift types. In terms of the reliability for high pressures and high rates. So the high reservoir pressure and high rate will allow you to produce the required rate at a limited drawdown. And the gas lift is delivering a limited Engineer Abdullah. Okay, it seems that Engineer Abdullah has lost his internet connection. So we're waiting for him to be back. Engineer Abdullah, can you hear me? Uh, 
sorry gents and there is a, a network interruption and I, i'm back now so yes. whenever you whenever you uh, don't plan for heavy workovers and the workover availability is not there to retrieve the other artificial left type the gas left will be a best option that allows also rigorous intervention in terms of adding and isolating producing zones. So the gas lift will give you full accessibility of the well and the reservoir in addition to low cost servicing. Moving forward, we have, this is a typical gas lift chart. The gas left pressure in the casing is represented by this low gradient line and this gas enters here and this is the dead fluid gradient that doesn't reach to the surface but once gas is mixed with the dead liquid in here at the bottom valve the gradient will decrease allowing the well to flow with the required rate. <laughs> Moving on, another sort of pump left is the jet pump. The jet pump is a simple artificial left method that can be run and retrieved by rigless operation. The jet pump can be run by slick line intervention and it sets in an open SSD profile. The SSD is a tubing accessory that allows opening and closing of this accessory to establish or close the app, the communication between the tubing and the annulus. The area between the tubing and the casing is called the annulus. Here, the communication between the tubing and the annulus is established by opening the SSD, then the, this jet pump is installed in the SSD profile. By pumping what we call the power fluid, the power fluid is pumped from normally from the tubing side, passing down the tubing and entering this pump through a nozzle. The nozzle will create a sudden pressure drop that creates a vacuum area. The vacuum area will allow this pressure drop to allow the well fluids to enter, creating some drawdown on the reservoir. So the well fluid will enter this area and mix with the power fluid. And both are produced through the SSD opening up to the casing and to the separator of the vessel, this vessel will be used to separate the power fluid from the produced fluid. So the produced fluid will be separated and sent to the facility and the power fluid will be recycled and pumped by the power fluid pump through the tubing, down the tubing, then through the pump and so on. So it is simply and also that creates a restriction leading to a vacuum area and the vacuum area will allow the pressure drop to allow the well fluids enter this area and mix it with the power fluid to be pumped out. This type of artificial left has the same advantage of the gas left of having a regular intervention be visible and easy servicing, retrieving and running of the pump. In addition to the low cost initially of the pump, so it is the perfect option for the testing purpose. So if we need a long test for a short term, we can use this pump as a testing. And also it can be used for long-term operation, but it is the best, the best option 
to evaluate a well for in terms of weeks or months. So this can be run and retrieved by a cheap slick line operation. But on the other hand, most of the companies have this type of equipment as rental equipment and the rental is high. So we need a power fluid to be available. We have a high running cost because this equipment have a high rental, but the initial cost is nothing. So as long as you have your SSD, you can run your SSD above the buffer. Once the well ceases to flow naturally, you can run in some sort of one day, you can run the jet pump and start operating your well by the jet pump. Another sort of artificial left pump left is the progressive cavity pump. It has the prime mover at the surface, which delivers the rotational movement through rod strength down to the PCP or the progressive cavity pump, which is composed of a rotor and a stator. A stator is a non-rotating part of the pump and the Rotor is a rotating part of the pump. It is a helical shaped, like you can see in this. And the stator will have some sort of elastomers in, in it. So this type of application is most commonly used for high density well fluids. To handle high density fluids, you will have the PCP as the best option. But there is some limitation in low density fluids because the elastomers will not sustain. It can fairly or moderately handle some solids, but it is not the highest pump that handles solids. But it can handle solids, it can handle high density fluids, and it is a reliable sort of Artificial left with a small footprint at the surface and a simple surface equipment, which is a prime mover that rotates the rods to rotate this rotor. And it should be noticed here that the progressive cavity pump is not a centrifugal pump. It is a positive displacement pump because the cavity will progress as you rotate your rotor and the, the progression of this cavity will lead the fluids to be produced up. It can handle moderate to high volumes and like we said, the best application is heavy fluids. And again, it is the PCP is a positive displacement pump. Back to one of the most commonly used artificial left system, which is the ESP or electrical submersible pump. The electrical submersible pump is one of the most expensive artificial left system in terms of the initial expenditure because it's a high in cost, a high servicing cost and it needs heavy workover activities to be replaced, but it is very reliable where you design it in the right way and you have the pump designed for the right application. It will live up to an average of 2.5 years and can live high run lives up to 10 or 15 years where you design it in the right way. So the ESP, what is an ESP? It is electrical submersible pump. It is a multi-stage centrifugal pump with several tens 
or most commonly hundreds of stages that are connected in series. It consists of the impeller, which is the rotating part, and the diffuser, which is the stationary part. The theory of working for the ESP is that the ESP generates head by the impeller rotation. The impeller rotation gives the fluid its head. The impeller rotation causes the movement of the fluids, and then the fluids will move from the impeller eyes into the diffuser. So the diffuser will start to divert this fluid up. This diffuser will then guide the fluids up to the next impeller, and the next impeller would add more energy by converting the kinetic energy to a potential energy. These are the typical components of an ESP pump system. The pump, which is the rotating, the pump, which is the uh, consisting of the impellers and diffusers, a multi-stage centrifugal pump driving by the motor, which converts the electrical energy coming to it from the surface through the power cable. The motor will divert this to a rotational energy and the rotation will be diverted to the pump. But we cannot cover the pump directly to the motor because the pump is containing well fluids and the motor will contain motor oil. Both cannot be coupled together. That's why we introduce another third equipment, which is called the seal or protector that couples the motor to the pump without hydraulically connecting from inside to prevent the motor to be contacted with the wheel fluids and be permanent. In addition to some other accessories aiding in the gas and solids handling. So as it has Hello again. Sorry for this interruption. But, but it seems that it is the internet connection. So, Engineer Abdullah will be here in a few moments. If anyone have any question uh, in this time, you can drop it in the chat because right now we are at the end of our session. Hello, Anjir Abdallah, you are still muted. Yeah, okay, so, sorry, back again. So what we have said that the motor drives the pump and cable to the pump through the seal 
and the motor is driving by electric power coming through the electric cable from the surface. And the two main enemies are the solids and gases. The solids are the first enemy because there are rotating parts that is affected by the solids and the gases because the pump is not designed to handle gases. So we need some sort of accessories to mix the gas before it enters the pump or to separate this gas into the anodes. The most weak point in this system is what it is the power cable, the failures in the power cable is one of the most common failure causes of the ESP system. This is how the ampler looks like. And this is the ampler from a top view is keyed to the shaft. And the ampler will rotate by its back hitting the fluid. This is the diffuser. Both of them are consisting one stage and the pump is a multi-stage, meaning that it consists of several amplers and diffusers consisting one pump section and the system will consist of several sections of the pump. So this is a typical ESP pump curve, which relates the head generated by the pump at different rates. So as the rate increases, the pump will generate a lower head. So this is a typical pump curve called the characteristic curve, the catalog curve or the pump curve. So at any rate, we can enter this curve for a single stage to detect how much head will be generated at this rate. So this is the last but not least part of our session today, which is the artificial left selection criteria and comparison. So as we can see for the gas lift, the advantage that it can handle sand production because it has no moving parts. It is effective in deviated wells as well for the same reason. There is no limitation on the depth and there is no rig requirement to service the gas lift. There is no limit on the gas handling because it is most commonly based on the gas that lighting the fluid column. So there is no limitation on the amount of gas that the system can handle. It has a low operating cost, but high initial cost due to the construction of the gas lift facility and compressors. It requires the makeup of a gas line to feed the compressor, and it requires an integral casing that is capable to withstand the injection of this gas. Same for the jet bomb, requires an integral casing as well. The capacity is limited at low reservoir pressure and high, uh, high back pressure. For example, because you are just the only parameter that you play with for a gas lift system is the density of the produced fluid. So the reservoir pressure should be capable of producing at least to overcome the new hydrostatic pressure, the well head flowing pressure, in addition to the fraction. So for example, only one parameter, which is the well head flowing pressure, if it cannot be exceeded by the reservoir pressure, the well cannot be produced by a gas lift. A simple example is a well that is equipped with gas lift and the back pressure is 1000 PSI. The reservoir pressure, if it is 1000 PSI, the gas lift is a no-go. It is impossible to produce a well that has a reservoir pressure of 1000 PSI to a flow line pressure of 1000 PSI. It is low or limited drawdown and not efficient in low rates. For a helical pump, it is the same concept as the ESP pump, but replacing the impeller by a helical or the stage by a helical rotor. This can give the system more 
ability to handle solids and heavy oils. In addition to, there is no elastomers unlike the PCP, but this helical pump will require reliable power source, same like the ESP, and a power cable will be a source of problem. It is the same concept of the ESP, only the stages are replaced by helical rotor and stator. The beam pump or the sucker root pump, a lot of companies have good experience in this type of pump. The pulling cost is just the cost of pulling the roads and running the roads, so it is relatively low cost and it doesn't require heavy work over, it's just a pulling unit can do the job. It's simple and reliable, low operating cost for right setup, and very low bottom wall flowing pressure will be achieved on the upper truck. It is instantaneous drawdown. It has a scattered unit, is a scattered unit that requires more servicing because there are more rotating parts and the most easy way that a surface, a problem in the surface equipment can be fixed without a workover. It will suffer in case of sand production because the rotor, if the solids enters between the plunger and the barrel or between uh, the rod and the tubing, it will lead to high frictions, erosion, and the stuck, maybe. So it will suffer in case of sand production, gas production, high rates, or high angles. So it is a very robust artificial left system in case of low rate, no sand, no gas. There is a limitation also in depth because of the loads on the surface unit and on the rods, and it is not used offshore because if of its high footprint. The ESP provides high production rates and high drawdowns, and it can be used for highly deviated well, but the limitation will be in the dog leg severity. The dog leg severity is the three dimensional change in the angle in each hundred foot. It can be conveyed on coil tubing, on tubing, or can be run and retrieved by wire line, which is the most recent advance in the ESP installation. So the disadvantage is the high maintenance cost. It suffers from gases and sand. It's not practical in shallow and low rate wells because the most common source of cooling for the ESP system is the produced fluid. So as the, low, the rates are lower, the cooling will be lower and the efficiency of the system will be lower. It requires a reliable power source, and the power cable is a source of problem, same as the helical pump. The jet pump, it requires no rig for pulling and installation. It has no moving parts, so it is fair to moderate handling for the sand. It's no deviation or depth constraints, and also it's perfect for short-term testing because it has a low initial expenditure, but the running cost is high. So it requires a high suction pressure, requires a power fluid, it has a low efficiency and high operating cost. This is the disadvantage of the jet pump. The PCP or the progressive cavity pump, it's a perfect option for heavy oils, can moderately handle solids and sand, it is a low power consumption pump and it has a light surface equipment with a small footprint. The rate capacity is limited and required to pull and run and has limitation of elastomers in terms of the temperature, the gases and the light fluids. So it is the most robust application where the API for the fluid is low, or the fluids are heavy in density. This is a typical 
selection criteria for a artificial left and why this these are the main parameters that you are using for the artificial left selection this is not these numbers don't consider it as a constant or something that is unchangeable because this depends mainly on the availability of the equipment the rating of the equipment in the country that you are working in so these this a typical selection criteria but not the typical numbers so you will select according to the depth both the measured depth and tvd the road pump will be limited in depth progressive cavity cavity pump will be 2000 to 6000 foot gas lift has no limitation on the depth almost the electrical submersible pump is the same but is not effective in shallow depth operating volumes wood pump can handle low rates but i have some challenges on this number i still consider the 5000 is high i may say 1000 or less so it's again in terms of the company policy and the availability of the equipment progressive cavity pump can handle higher rates but here as I just i said gas lift and electrical submersible pump are super in terms of the rate the corrosion handling for the wood pump is good to excellent. The progressive cavity is fair because it has the rotor and stator and some moving components that will enhance the corrosion to happen inside the pump. The gas lift is good to excellent in terms of the corrosion handling and the electrical submersible pump still has some corrosion issue. That's why you need to select the right materials for the electrical submersible pump. Gas handling is also not that good because if gas enters your barrel, what merely the pump will do is to compress and expand the gases. So the pump will have a gas bound or gas lock. That's why the gas is a challenge in the wood pump, also for the electrical submersible pump, but not a challenge in the gas lift. So wherever you have a high GOR, you can go to the gas lift directly. Solid handling also, as we said, these are not the always fixed numbers, but it is just for guidance. Fluid gravity for the PCP, what we can say the main highlight whenever you have a high density fluid, you go to PCP or progressive cavity pump. Wood pump can handle dense fluids also, but with a limitation of eight API. The angle is not a challenge in the gas lift, but still the Douglas severity is a challenge in the electrical submersible pump. The deviation itself is not whereby the progressive cavity and the wood pump has a limitation on both dog leg and inclination. Servicing is the easiest for the gas lift, but requires work over for the other three, but for the wood pump, it is a light work over or bowling unit. The system efficiency, the best efficiency is for the progressive cavity pump, up to 70 and for both electrical submersible pump and wood pump up to 60. The lowest efficiency is the, in the gas lift in addition to the jet pump is a low efficiency as well. That's all from uh, my side for this comparison. Just bear in mind that the criteria for the selection of a particular type of the artificial lift mechanism can be depending on several Parameters, which is the reservoir parameters, pressure, productivity index, water cut, and so on. The well parameters in terms of the deviation and completion, whether you plan for a workover possibility or not, the cost that is available in your hand. The local experience is one sort of, active, uh, of selection that is 
normally neglected because you would need to install some sort of artificial lab that you have experience with to troubleshoot and maintain your system in a healthy condition. Availability of resources, for example, for the gas lift, the gas lift gas and the gas compression system. Standardization in your company is something that you would look at because it's not a very good practice to change the artificial lift type from one type to another because it's not only the change cost, but the facility at the surface will be changed. The hookup alignment will be changed in addition to other hidden costs that you may not take into account. And the reliability of the system is the last but not least parameter of the selection criteria. That's all from my side and thank you all. And now it's time for answering the question. Thank you so much, Anjir Abdullah. So if anyone please uh, still have any question, uh, please type it in the chat. And then this yeah. time I will share with you a link for the feedback of this session for us to be always improving and fulfilling your needs. So the first question is which pump is used in jump pump? Is it centrifugal pump or PD pump? Yeah, so because the jet pump is, has no rotating or centrifugal pump, it's not a positive displacement pump, it is a third type of pump which is hydraulic pump. So the jet pump is one sort of hydraulic pumps and and uh, uh, there are other sorts of hydraulic pumps that are not discussed today. So it's hydraulic pump, not centrifugal pump. Okay, we have effective another. Method, ah, sorry. Which artificial left method is effective method, jet pump or ESP? So uh, uh, ESP is the most effective in high rates, as we said, and it's uh, the most effective in high rates, and whenever you know exactly your well parameters and expect your future parameters, because you will not be in good shape if you install an ESP bump for a well that will cut water to 100% in a few months. So should be reliable wherever you have a robust data for your well high rates, low gas, and low solids. Jet pump is fantastic, but it has some operational challenges in addition to that. Rates are moderate, not as high as the ESP, and the jet pump also is low initial cost, but is not very preferred where your reservoir pressure is expected to drop and with time, but the ESP is a fantastic in uh, delivering high drawdown, down, especially where the GOR is low and the bubble point is low. How we can select any artificial left method, I think is covered. The difference between boosted displacement pump and centrifugal pump. Centrifugal pump is relying on the centrifugal forces the M plug will give the kinetic energy to the fluids and the diffuser will divert this energy to potential energy by the diverting the direction of the flow. But the positive displacement, just the positive displacement pump are not effective, uh, affected by the back pressure because it's just pushing, it fills just like a syringe that you uh, used for injecting medicine, it is the same concept. Longer that displaces the fluids, whatever the back pressure against it, as long as it is capable to push these fluids against the loads. Okay, so I, uh, if you have any other questions, just type them. Which artificial left method is effective missile jet bomb or ESP? Thank you. Mm. 
So uh, I, I think all the selection criteria is uh, is covered. How can you select saccharide pump if we'll have you are more than 500? So you have, you can install gas separator also with the saccharide pump, that's one point that we didn't mention. And it still has good potential and blue water cut. Any good recommendation for the gas anchor utilization? No, just gas separation. And uh, that's it uh, from my side. But why don't you think about other artificial left, especially that the GOR is not still not that high, 500 to 1,000, you can still install ESP if you have installed the sucker root pump for a long time and the well capability is high, you can install, why not you increase the production and install ESP. PCB using for large depths, no, uh, because it has also the road length and this road is hanging on the, the maximum load is, uh, is at the surface point, it's carrying all the load of the road weight, so large depth, no. The limitation of artificial left methods we have covered. Thank you all, any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone. Please don't forget also to fill uh, the link that I sent. So we will stop taking questions. Uh, maybe Anjir uh, Abdallah, you can just answer this last question uh, that yes. is for Amir and we will stop taking questions. Yeah, so is a plugging issue. So uh, I have dedicated one session before for the uh, ESP troubleshooting, but for the blogging issue, it's one of the main uh, troubles, operational troubles for the ESP that may lead to failures uh, of your ESP uh, system. And this blogging can be cured by two methods. Uh, the prevention, which is better than the cure. The prevention will come from the inhibition. Inhibition, of the scales, if the plugging comes from the scales, so you need to think about the scale inhibitor that you would pump in several ways, either by batches in the analog through control line or by sending these cap encapsulated corrosion inhibited or using chemical screen. So this is on the prevention of the scaling. In addition to the avoiding the favorable conditions for the scale accumulation, like running on the temperatures and the pressures that is not enhancing the scale accumulation. That is number one on the inhibition. On the removal of the scale, you will use the backwash, starting by diesel and xylene, which used to remove the hydrocarbon deposits and HCL that removes the uh, non-organic scales. So prevention and treatment are for the corrosion inhibitor, uh, uh, scale inhibitor, sorry, and back washes. On the other hand, the plugging may be caused by improper clean out of your downhole uh, of the well. This will be cured by the proper <laughs> clean out in the next workover. And in addition to avoiding the sand production by limiting the drawdown, if you have a sand production problem, using sand screen will be effective for solid production prevention, but will be on the other hand, a problem source if it is a scaling problem because it creates a high pressure drop across the screen uh, if you have not a proper design for your screen. Okay. Thank you so much, Engineer Abdullah. So again, everyone, Engineer Abdullah is going to deliver our 4x4 program that is about this topic, that is artificial lift. So you can go to our social media and register or just search through the links that I shared in the start of the session.
Thank you everyone for being with us today and thank you Anjir Abdallah for this interesting uh, webinar. It was uh, really clear and really nice and have much of uh, information that is really important for everyone. So we hope to see you to see you all uh, with us in our 4x4 program and uh, goodbye for now everyone and I hope that you all enjoyed this webinar. Thank you all and have a good day.